March 16th. And uh, we have a fairly light meeting today, but I'm very much looking forward to our presentations. Um, so we can have some good, I think, good discussion around them without feeling overwhelmed by some of our uh, fuller agendas that we've had lately. Um, so I will call the regular session to order. Can we have a roll call, please? Yes, Mayor Seaman. Here. Council Member Castellano. Here. Council Member Moulton. Here. Council Member Arroyo. Here. Council Member Bauer. Here. And Council Member Bergell. Here. All right. Um, would you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? And I'll go ahead and do it today. Do we have a flag, Pam? <laughs> You can see it. Yes. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. That is a, a lot less awkward when everybody isn't talking and everybody has like the different time place things. Uh, do we have a report out of the closed session, Mr. City Attorney? Yes, Mayor. No reportable actions were taken in closed session. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now we are going to move on to the mayor's announcements, and we have one proclamation today, and I've asked Council Member Bauer if he would read it, and it is for Tsunami Preparedness Week. All right. Thank you, Mayor Seaman. This is uh, in recognition of Tsunami Preparedness Week, March 22nd through the 26th, 2021. Whereas California's long coastline, its proximity to other coastal states with offshore earthquake faults and its location on the Pacific Ring of Fire make it vulnerable to tsunamis. And whereas 37 tsunamis have been recorded on California's North Coast since 1933, including five that caused damage. And whereas 11 residents of Del Norte County, California were killed by the tsunami generated by the 1964 Alaska earthquake. And whereas one resident of Del Norte County, California was killed by a tsunami generated by the 2011 Japanese earthquake. And whereas Tsunamis caused by underwater landslides, as well as near source offshore earthquakes can occur at any time with little warning. And whereas education and awareness are fundamental to saving lives in the event of a tsunami. And whereas the state of California, the National Weather Service, and the County of Humboldt commemorate the 10th anniversary of the 2011 Japan tsunami and the 57th anniversary of the Alaska tsunami by testing their ability to issue a tsunami warning for Humboldt County via the emergency alert system between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. on March 24th, 2021. Now, therefore, Mayor Susan Seaman, on behalf of the Eureka City Council, do hereby proclaim the week of March 22nd through March 26th, 2021, as Tsunami Preparedness Week in the city of Eureka. Thank you very much. Do we have anybody here to accept this proclamation? Yes, Mayor, I believe. Um, uh, Director Gerving, our NOAA person, Ryan is here. That's correct. Ryan, go ahead and uh, feel free to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? I can indeed, thanks. Okay, you may hear my three-year-old in the background watching a video, so. Um, so I just wanted to say, you know, thank you um, for you know, this proclamation for recognizing Tsunami Preparedness Week. Um, it's next week. Uh, this is our chance to, you know, talk to everybody about the tsunami risks in our area because they are they are real, um, both from distant source and local source tsunamis. And for Tsunami Week, um, one of the things we do at the Weather Service is the, the tsunami test. And that's a live code is we, it's what we call it. It's a real, like we issue a tsunami warning through our system to see how everything works. And that happens on the 24th next week between 11 a.m. and noon, as was said in the proclamation. Um, we activate the emergency alert system. It goes to TV, radio, uh, weather radio. 
and we'll activate some sirens in some areas. So all of that's happening next week. And then we'll also do other social media posts and, act, act, and um, normally in a normal year without um, COVID ongoing, there'd be other activities ongoing, but mostly we'll be doing virtual type things this year. Um, and I wanna emphasize this test next week is for a distant source tsunami. Um, it's very different than that local source event um, where uh, you, have, you feel the earthquake and the wave can arrive really quickly, like within 10 minutes. Distant source events, we can activate the emergency alert system. We can fly civil air patrol planes down the coastline. Um, we can even go door to door and knock and knocking on people's doors to get out of the, um, the tsunami zone uh, because we have many hours until the wave arrives. Um, so it's a very different event. And so I just wanna emphasize that that's the event we're testing here. We're testing the communication system for something that would come from Alaska, you know, a big earthquake in Alaska or Japan or Chile or something like that, where we have many hours. Um, I, that, that's, that's the big thing. Don't expect to see this type of system work after we have a huge earthquake in our area. Um, you have to use that earthquake as your warning. So different type of events. Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Anybody have any questions? All right. Thank you for doing that every year. I got my all of my texts last year. It worked perfectly for me. Keep that up. Excellent. I'm glad that, yeah, the, the test system is working. Um, it, that, that reminds me, there is the one thing, though, that won't be tested this year, and is, we never have tested it yet, is the wireless emergency alert system to cell phones. Um, that actually comes from the Tsunami Warning Center. Um, so when they do, when they issue their warning, it'll come to your cell phone through their system. But another system that will be tested this year and has been tested in previous years is the reverse calling system from like the city of Eureka or the county. And so that's the, the message you probably received. Um, and Brian might be able to tell more about that. Yeah. Well, right. Sure, and thanks for the opportunity, Ryan. Since mm -hmm. last year, uh, the city has been in the process of implementing uh, a new alert system for the city's residents. It's called, uh, well, we call it Eureka Alert, but it's Everbridge in the background. And, um, we are going to be testing that for the first time this year for uh, Tsunami Preparedness Week and, and the test that Ryan spoke of. So we're mimicking the same message that the county is using to alert their uh, emergency uh, notification recipients so that the messaging is consistent. And uh, so far, we've got a lot of people in our system, but many of them were imported in and uh, didn't sign up online. So we'd like to encourage folks to go to the city's website right at the top, you'll see an opportunity to register. So far, we've only had about 160 people do that. We'd like to see, you know, heck, 100 times that number. And, uh, uh, but people will see that message come through. They'll get phone calls next week. Don't be alarmed. The messaging will say that. Don't be alarmed. It's just a test. But uh, still, people should be prepared for it and go to the website to sign up. Thank you very much. All right, you guys, now you know. Um, I remember after the first big fires in Santa Rosa, I had a friend who lived down there and she said before the fires, hardly anybody had signed up for the emergency. And after the fires, everybody did. So what we're trying to do is reverse that. So <laughs> if you aren't registered, get in there and do it. Um, before we go to our presentations, I'll just give a brief um, mayor's report. We did have our first meeting of the um, traffic safety task force. We had about 20 people. We sort of just set the stage about what our goals are, which are to um, write a proclamation that will be shared amongst all the agencies there um, with their organizations or cities. And I'm really happy to say that um, Rio Dell was in attendance, Trinidad, Blue Lake, um, Arcata and Fortuna have both expressed interest so, and Virginia Bass, um, our supervisor was also there. And we talked about, um, really, I think the first session was just sort of people sort of talking about how important traffic safety is. We're now gathering all kinds of information about different programs that have already happened. We're putting them together and we will um, create a countywide proclamation and a messaging campaign that helps people sort of get behind the idea that traffic safety is um, 
It's not just a series of acts, it's a community value and we all have to take responsibility for it. At least that's what we're working on. So that is my update on that. And I will have something every month to update now that we've started our meetings at least for the next five months. And with that, um, my report is over so we can get right into our presentations. We have a couple of them today. And the first one, I would like to invite um, Dr. Jackson, the president of HSU and Dr. Flamer from College of the Redwoods who recently completed a um, they recently completed a summit where they're working together. And as you know, Eureka's nestled nicely in between those two colleges and uh, they have a serious impact on our community. So I'm excited to hear what they are going to talk about. And Pam, can we sh give, uh, Tom, do you, are you the one that wants to share? Yes, and it looks like I can, <clears throat> is that right? I see ya. I I think everyone can see that, I hope. We can, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mayor, and good evening to all of you. First off, on behalf of both President Flamer and myself, thank you for your service to our local community. It, it matters a lot, as you already know, and it's certainly not easy, uh, but it's something neither Keith or I will ever want to do. And so our hands go off to, to all of you for the things that you do. Both Keith and I are gonna spend a little time talking about the relationship between Humboldt State University and the College of the Redwoods. But to set this up ever so slightly, there are little more than 450 municipalities in California. There are 116 different community colleges and 23 uh, CSUs throughout California. Eureka is one of the most unique, the North Coast, I should say in general, one of the more unique communities because we have both a community college and a four-year public university. Not if... Oops, I think you froze. Yes, municipality can make that claim, brings to other, yes. I did that deliberately so Keith would have to do the whole presentation. <laughs> also, I'm sorry to interject, but it for me the presentation looks like it's not um, in presentation in full presentation mode. I don't know if others are seeing that as well. No, Just wanted to let you know. Start the slideshow part portion of it. I did start it. Uh, oh. And I'm seeing a full slideshow. Okay, we're seeing like the, oh. oh. I, I we can still see your slide. <laughs> <laughs> can, you re can you do it now? Yeah, I'll restart. You see the slide? It's so, the beginning. There you go. Maybe a bad internet day. President Jackson, well, if you if you will start the slideshow and then share screen, that may take care of it. We'll try that. Stick with me, everyone. This is the 2021 equivalent of not having the right cable. <laughs> <laughs> when I worked for Keat TV for 15 years, I would have to go different places and run uh, VHS tapes and every single one had a different setup. I'm gonna suggest to Keith oh because God. you also, Keith, you also have the PowerPoint. Do you mind pulling yours up? It could be my internet. It's quite possible anyway. I'll stop share. I think I already did. It's trying to come up. 
I wonder if Lisa has that. Okay. I do not, but if someone sends it to me, I can give it a shot. Okay, I have it up, but it's not letting me share. Do you need permission to share screen? Yes. Can we give uh, President Flamer permission to share screen? Actually, anybody. Oh, anybody can. can. Have it. Uh -huh. okay. Excellent. Um, we have six Okay, uh -huh. Tom, now that you put all this power in my hand, I could screw this up now. You know that, right? I do. And, but I'm not worried even in the slightest. And so not at all. If I freeze, let me know. And, and so we're one of the more unique municipalities. And, and that is a, a blessing for each of us in many respects, which is why the relationship between CR and Humboldt is so important and so critical. It's one of the things that brought both President Flamer and myself together in a very deliberate way, because this just made sense to the uniqueness of our two institutions in the location that we happen to reside uh, with the opportunities in front of us in the 2021 uh, era. It's a perfect scenario for us to revamp not only our two institutions come in more alignment as institutions to really better the opportunities for education. So that in, in a way is the background. Go ahead and go one more slide, Pete. Tom, you froze. How about you take this one, Keith? Oh, you back? I think Tom's back. Back. Yep. Lisa? I'll stop my video, and okay, gotcha. maybe that will help help me a little bit. And so, one of the things when we had our recent summit. We were focused on a number of areas, primarily academics, student services, enrollment management facilities, as you can see, and our community partnerships, inclusive of athletics. And, and the, we were deliberate. We brought individuals and their counterparts, both of our institutions, and the number total were our two institutions to figure out how we could work together to really understand the depth of why we did it. If you'll read that paragraph with me, because it really dives into the details in a, in a very simple way, why it mattered to us. The of the summit and the partnership really was to make it easier for the students to transfer. And this is very significant because we do have students returning uh, to the two year institution to continue their education. Uh, by more closely aligning our programs to lower our institutional costs by sharing physical and human resources and to increase student graduation rates by ensuring a continuity of support services uh, between our two institutions. Go ahead, Keith. So it mattered to both of us and that gives you a, a really good idea of, of how this worked for our two institutions. Thank now over the next few what? slides, over the next few slides, Keith and I are going to go back and forth, and but we're not going to talk about everything on the slide. And so if you wonder if we're skipping things deliberately, that is as well. Go ahead, Keith. Thank you. And what, what Tom mentioned at the beginning is that we have 116 community colleges and 23 CSU campuses in California. And throughout the, the, the state of California, what, what CR and Humboldt State University is putting together is the most unique I have ever seen in California, but also as unique in, in, in the whole nation. So we are looking beyond just general 
on the pathways and we're looking at the, the, the synergy, every aspect of our institutions, culturally, staff development and, and administration. And that's very key. Um, what, what of course we are about academics and trying our best align our curriculum to workforce needs. What we really have to do here is point to the work that HSU and CR has done with our, with our, ner with our nursing departments. Um, so I was able to hand to HSU at least 40 students a direct transfer from CR's nursing program straight, straight to the BSN. And that is one tangible way of looking at how we are aligning our curriculum and workforce needs. And we're looking at others down in the future as well. And we also recognize at the outset is that we have to do more to help um, our relationships with, with, with our, our local tribes. And, and doc, Dr. Jackson has a wonderful advisory committee that, that he has invited me to, which I am a part of. But even more so is that CR has, has, de has, has designated a layout to Kente Jackson, who, is the, who will directly work with tribes, but also specifically work closely with HSU to make sure that, that CR and myself are aligning our curriculum and our student services to better serve our our students who are native, because of course that we all know that sometimes a bureaucracy is hard to understand if you're not even if you're not a part of that that particular bureaucracy, and it's probably even more so with certain uh, communities. And we want to make sure that we have have um, decreased or let or broke down broken down as many barriers as we can. And we've also recognized that we share a lot, not just our curriculum. But we also share staff, both in faculty and classified staff. And being at high higher education, we see a very big advantage to sharing our professional development staffing and opportunities, both in curriculum um, and um, other staff development. And actually, we could point to the work that our Multicultural Diversity Committee uh, Department is doing with Humboldt State's, you know, State's Department as well, even through the pandemic, even though we can't be physically together, but we have put our joint um, needs together, but also looked at how we can develop both our staff and faculty and other ways uh, via uh, Zoom. So, the, so are the, the pandemic may have slowed us down slightly, but we haven't given up on and the things that we want to do. Okay, Tom. One of the things that, that seems like it should have been done a long time ago, but it's difficult given the two different bureaucracies in which we work is creating a joint admissions process. But the joy of the CSU and the California Community College systems are that students who graduate from a community college with an associate degree for transfers automatically get accepted to a CSU. But this is our ability as two local institutions to strengthen that, not only through alignment of courses, but to seamlessly make it simple for those students that are not only in CR, but also at HSU. <clears throat> so finding that natural sweet spot, which we're working on, to jointly admit a student to both of our institutions at the same time, to seamlessly flow between our two is in process. Continuing on, number nine, creating reciprocal agreements between us uh, also is a wonderful opportunity and time for us to explore different things to do. For example, holding classes on each other's campuses. We do that to some degree already. CR has the benefit of having multiple locations, and, and that certainly will benefit HSU in a very uh, deliberate way. But we are also are exploring joint retail operations, joint housing opportunities, and we've already publicly talked about uh, looking very closely at how we can synergize our collective career development offices. Now, there's other things that we share with our student services that we haven't necessarily discussed, but this opens that door for them in a very meaningful way. 
for example, healthcare between our two students or advising, which we already loosely do between the two institutions. So you see the window of opportunity is very wide open now that we've uh, opened the door to communicating and looking very deliberately at what we can do as two campuses. Number 11 is uh, deliberately establishing a CR and HSU alumni organization. And this may be something that all of you have wanted to do for a good number of years because we live here in this community. HSU has about 10,000 alumni living along the North Coast. <clears throat> 2,500 of those are both CR and HSU alums. And, and that is a number that, that we have great pride in, as I know CR does as well. And those joint individuals are very active in this community. And I couldn't tell you if any of you are on this phone call, this Zoom call right now, but I bet there's at least a few of you that have gone not only to CR, but also to HSU. Next slide. There are some things between our two campuses that, that impact Eureka in a very deliberate way, which is also the reason why our partnership matters. The connection between CR and HSU for a student is a bus, if not the 101. The 101 is down. It's difficult to get from point A to point B, except in the world. So the bus route has mattered, and we've discussed that in the past, not only as two campuses, but also with uh, city leadership. Downtown vibrancy is also something that we're watching very closely. We want to put more of our workforce in Eureka, both of us, and we want to have more students in Eureka um, generating not only that economic engine, but also enjoying all the things that Eureka provides. That's that entrepreneurship value that we originally talked about years ago. Something else that has been on the forefront of everyone's minds has been what's happening at HSU regarding our polytechnic efforts and what is happening at CR about HSU and polytechnic. And we'll immediately go into CR and workforce degrees, which will end our presentation and we'll take questions right about that time. HSU, without question, has been built for polytechnic success. And, and one of the simple reasons is where we are located. As you know, there's two polytechnics in California, none in Northern California. But HSU doesn't see ourselves as a Northern California university. We, we in a way, don't even see ourselves strictly as a California university. We see ourselves as a very broad regional university with national aspirations. Our footprint goes from Alaska to Hawaii to San Diego, all the way over to Reno and beyond. Uh, students pull from as far as Virginia and Maryland uh, to here, and you already know 85% of our student body comes from someplace other than Humboldt County. We are set up very well to be a polytechnic because of our ocean, our, our agriculture, and the ruralness next slide, please. As we're building our polytechnic efforts, we are looking very closely at creating a different type of polytechnic, not one that was necessarily built 100 years ago, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we are looking at 21st century items that will define a new type of polytechnic experience for students in the local community. One where science serves society in a very different way. One where the foundation of our programs, particularly engineering programs, which are often centered around math and science, are also inclusive of sustainability, a very strong sustainable foundation, in fact. One that looks at what is needed in the future and forefront and goes after it in a very different way, future focused, I guess you can say. And some might say today that we are a polytechnic without that designation. And, and many of you have said that to me as well as other alumni. And that is in large part why the CSU invited HSU to look very closely at this designation because of the strength 
of those program, polytechnic programs that we presently have. I have just a couple more slides. When you think about HSU, here's a short graph and it's as large as we could make it. This is the percent of students that are in the natural resources STEM fields, STEM being science, technology, engineering, and math. And if you look overall, the average in the CSU is 25%. And Humboldt is sitting just below 40%, and we are third behind Pomona and San Luis Obispo. Go ahead, next slide. When you take engineering, which Pomona and San Luis Obispo have a lot more than we do, you'll see in just a moment, Humboldt is first in the number of uh, natural resources and other STEM majors, not including engineering. The overall average in the CSU is only 16%. So we are incredibly uh, high when it comes to the number of majors we have as a component of our university. Next slide. I've already mentioned one of the terms, but one of the things that have, we have to strengthen as a university is our applied sciences, our technology, and, and our engineering. When we, and how we would become a polytechnic. But, uh, that to be true, go ahead to the next slide, it will be my final slide. On this slide, you'll see that HSU has 14 programs in the science area right now, and they're all simply amazing. We have one engineering program, which is equally amazing, amazing in environmental resources engineering. We have three in applied science, and one in technology, very strong computer science. But to grow as a polytechnic, we might must add engineering programs, we must add applied science programs or technology programs. Question centers locally really around what things we will do and add. It usually falls upon in engineering, applied science, and technology. It is hard not to remove any of our other outstanding programs because they are what make HSU strong and very unique. They also will balance out the experience students as a polytechnic. That gives you a short overview of what it means for HSU and some of what we intend to do at HSU. Our timeline I can talk about later if it's one of those questions that you might have. But I encourage you also to look at humboldt.edu slash polytechnic and we put everything that we have on that web page and more, including information on the nine different committees working on this today. I'll pass it to you, Keith, to talk about workforce degrees. Thank you. And quite, quite, quite frankly, CR is is one hundred percent supportive of HSU making this important uh, move to being a a, a technic. Uh, we now will have an opportunity to send our st our STEM students to Humboldt State and not have to have them transfer out of the county. So th this is great for CR. And I will do everything I can to make to help uh, Dr. Jackson move this forward. Uh, there, there are three degrees currently that that, that we've, we've implemented that are very, very strong and will really help help what we're doing in our county. One is in in our we you you know that we've always had a strong um, addiction studies program, but now we have elevated that program to to a a social work degree that will feed directly into HSU's master's program. So now we have an avenue for students who are uh, to, to get a, from a two-year degree to a four-year degree and a master's degree. So that pathway is much stronger now. But also, as, as we've talked about in the last year and a half, is, is that we, we are partnering with, with uh, Nordic Aqua Farms to build an aquaculture program at CR. We had one, I'm told back in the dark ages, probably in the 90s, which uh, may, some people may have been um, at CR at the time, 
but it was a small program, but we're going to, to reinvent that aquaculture program at CR and bring that forward. And we are, we are looking at building a lab um, in partnership with Nordic and, and the city to uh, build a lab in downtown Eureka somewhere or in Eureka somewhere, I'm not sure where that's going to be. But, but we really want our lab to be in Eureka and, and have our students take courses there and to, to, to contribute to the culture of Eureka that way. And we've also had a very strong uh, computer information system program. But what, but what we're seeing right now with the pandemic is, is a very high need to build stronger security around a cyber software. So we are going to elevate this degree so, 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 that, so that students can come to CR, pick up a, a cybersecurity certificate or degree and, and be able to work anywhere in the nation from their home and being, being able to really get a job almost immediately once, once, they, once they get done with their academic program at CR. At about a year and a half ago, uh, CR did embark on an education master plan process. And, and that, that, that's because in the pandemic, we recognized that CR had to fundamentally change how it does business in terms of, of academic preparation. Uh, we saw and we, we, we continue to see a lot of other players, both, uh, both education players but also business players um, get, getting into what has traditionally been CR's academic business. We see program uh, companies like Google and Hulu and, and others seeing that, that, that there is a market for education. And why is that? There's about a, a $7 trillion education market worldwide. And we see a lot of other people getting involved in education, which means I'm, I'm having CR revisit its, its fundamental business plan on, on education. And we've been, in, we've been in this process for about a year and a half. And we have presented a lot of challenges and, and opportunities that, that, that CR has identified. Clearly, one of the challenges that we have is to identify the niche market of, of which CR has to be known for and look at other ways of bringing education and different types of education. Really fundamentally asking ourselves, um, what, what, do we, what do we want to be known for? And what, do we, what also do we want to do? And what is it that CR wants to be a leader moving forward with? And how can CR maintain or be more relevant moving forward? Those are the hard fundamental questions that as a culture of, of, of education, it's really hard to engage in, but our faculty and staff are moving forward with that. And, and the third thing that we're doing is we're going to have a, a, a workforce summit on April 9th. And I think Mayor Seaman, you may have received an, an, an invitation from, from myself or S Cynthia Petrucia. And really what we're trying to do here is, is ask our, our community, both private and also our um, businesses and other places exactly what they want CR to do. What do they want CR to, to support moving forward? And these, these are the questions that we're going to wrestle with over the next year and to see how we can fundamentally change the, the, the direction of CR moving forward. Mayor Siemens, that concludes our presentation for your indulgence and, and patience as we work through the technical details. I'm sure there are questions. Keith will answer all of them. <laughs> Thank you. And I know I was like, could you come talk for 10 minutes and just address everything that both of you guys are doing? So um, I am very impressed that you were able to get so much into your presentation. Does anybody have any questions or comments for um, either uh, President Flamer or President Jackson? Councilmember Arroyo. 
Thank you both for coming. I'm so excited that you were able to be with us tonight. And I feel really honored that you both took time to present about this to us and to bring some of your colleagues um, as well who are here. So thank you. Um, I was really excited to participate in HSU's strategic plan working group around community collaboration and shared success. And so um, I was fortunate to be able to um, just add ideas and, and talk about how much I want the city of Eureka and HSU to have a closer relationship. And, a, and I, that certainly is true for CR as well. I've had fewer opportunities to, to engage um, with CR directly, but I would love to do that more. Um, so to the question around, you know, what would really be an area of additional focus, I realize um, capacity is limited and, um, and, you know, these might be future things, but to really increase the types of medical specialty training that people can get in our region is just such a huge, huge, huge need. Um, and I mean, you know, like dental and um, occupational therapy the assistant and a number of specialties that I think um, could be could be offered in this area um, and are in, in great demand as we see our population's needs changing. So that would be my two cents on areas where I'd love to see growth. Um, also, just I was happy to hear the emphasis on, on transit. Um, I'm the Humboldt Transit Authority Chair and um, but I also represent Eureka. And one thing that I've seen as a real need um, over the years serving on the HTA board has really been a need to make the systems of transit more seamless in our community. And one, I'm just gonna call it what it is. One thing that's really challenging and for students is that Arcata has a separate transit system than everyone else. Um, and as Eureka's representative to HTA, I know that we recently in the last couple of years had Eureka Transit Service actually transfer to HTA uh, for management. Um, and therefore the fare structure was simpler, the um, transfers were simpler for transit users. Um, so one thing I hear in the community is, um, particularly for people who don't have the Jack Pass, um, or some kind of pass system um, is that the transfer between the systems is really challenging and that that really affects people who, um, who use transit in our community. So I just wanted to put that out there. I think as the city of Eureka, we're not in the position to tell Arcata what to do with their transit line um, that they have always cherished and loved to manage. Um, but it might be an opportunity to um, talk collectively about that some more and just kind of what that might look like to increase ease of use and ensure that we have enough transit riders and enough uh, comfort with users of the system. Um, so beyond that, I just um, want to voice my incredible support for um, the possibility of the polytechnic um, you know, being a, a polytech and um, see what we could do to support, I'd be happy to uh, write a letter of support or anything else that we can do. I do believe there's- Stevens, if I may. Uh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. The, the, we're not ready for the letters yet, but you can start thinking about what you will want to say because we will need those uh, in due time. The Samoa property on the south side of Arcata, we were designating that primarily for medical and technology uh, research and issues and, and programs. And we're, we still have healthcare, that is, and we still have things to do in the design and discussion parts, but that should, it should indicate the emphasis that we're placing on those two areas. Unbe behind the scenes right now, our discussions with other institutions on how we can strengthen our, our uh, healthcare, our programs in the health sciences, and even align some of that with other institutions to create a better uh, pathway for more of that in this community. I say that so that you're aware that we've heard you and, and we're hearing you. 
it just takes a little time for us to get all the ducks in a row, I guess you could say. And the pandemic certainly hasn't helped, but those things are in motion and we're trying to align them. And hopefully over the next few years, you'll hear and see more of that occur. As far as the bus goes, I heard you. Okay, if, I, if I add something to that one, if I can. Certainly. Thank you. Um, about a year and a half ago, when, when Dr. Jackson and I started talking about aligning uh, our curriculum, healthcare was a major conversation. And uh, CR has been engaged in the last year of, of looking at different types of, of, of healthcare programs of what CR should own, if you will, for the first two years and how we, we can align our curriculum with a four-year curriculum and hand that off to HSU. So yeah, we, we heard you before too, and uh, we, we are act actively looking at that. Dr. Jackson, I would like, I hear um, often, and I know you say it over and over and it doesn't hurt to repeat it. Um, what will a polytechnic do to the liberal arts part of the university? The liberal arts is a major component of every polytechnic university in the United States. And the, those are those things that we all need the writing, the critical thought, the worldview of, of place and time, our history, all the things that create an educated, an educated citizenry uh, that, that we define as an educated citizenry are part of that liberal arts, the arts, the humanities, the music, et cetera. So they're critical to the success of every graduating student. What happens in a polytechnic is the emphasis as an institution is arguably placed in engineering and sciences and technology, but the basis for every graduate remains the liberal arts, as well as those liberal arts degrees. And so it's a wonderful combination as of all worlds. It literally is the best of all worlds, especially when you have an incredibly strong liberal arts program that we can build a base upon for some of these new emerging programs that California really needs, primarily in engineering and the sciences and technology and the applied sciences. So I hope I answered your question. Uh, you did. Summary, now I'm they are critical. Mm -hmm. uh, Council Member Moulton. I hate to always be the one who's asking what you know, what's this going to cost us? But um, if you're gaining additional programs through uh, focus on polytechnic, and I hear you saying that the liberal arts are still very important of a well-rounded education, uh, but are there going to be degree programs or sections of the university that will be, that are not being utilized that are going to go away? Right now, the university as every university throughout the United States has to structurally look at itself for the things that we evolve toward or from. And HSU has historically done that. And when we go back to the foundation of HSU, there were programs that we didn't have that we certainly have today. I couldn't tell you how these will evolve over the coming years. I just know that they will evolve over the coming years somehow whether they are a combination of existing programs or the same program today redefined. Every professor has the wonderful opportunity of creating an amazing student experience uh, that, that will educate it, that citizenry. And each year they look at individually the curriculum that they intend to share with that student over a period of time. That will continue to happen every single year and it often changes to keep current with the trends that we have today. So the short answer is that we're constantly changing and I couldn't tell you what may be here a few years from now or even 10 years from now, or even if some of the programs we have today will evolve to something else. But I will say that's the natural order of what we do as a university. And if we don't evolve, then we're not doing what we ought to be doing as a university. You kind of alluded to the cost and, and in many respects, Funding comes from employers, external grants, gifts, 
individuals that are more interested in some of the programs that we may be offering coming forward, kind donations to help students with scholarships or even to fund programs. But it also comes with a renewed interest in HSU as a polytechnic. And we're seeing that even today without being a polytechnic, just saying that we are in the process is showing interest from students who want to be at a polytechnic. And to give you an example, between Pomona and San Luis Obispo, they turn away roughly 25,000 students. We have 6,500 students at HSU, but they turn away 2,500 students who wanted to be part of a polytechnic university. That's not to say they're all coming to Humboldt County and it, we definitely couldn't take all 25,000 even if we wanted to. But that does give you an indicate of the interest in those types of degrees and us growing those degrees will only grow us as a university. And that also strengthens every single program that we have as a university. It balances our workforce in such a way and it really strengthens the economy that we have in our local region in a very significant way. Thank you, I, uh, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, which leads actually to my other question, speaking of community partnerships and business partnerships, uh, as much as I love the idea of Nordic Aqua Farms, there's no fish growing there just yet. If that does not happen, is there any chance at CR that there would be an aquaculture program going forward without this direct support from Nordic Aqua Farms? Oh, absolutely, yes. Because um, we already, yes, we because we already have secured several thousand dollars from the state to build the lab and to bring this program on board. So yes, we, we're, we, we are committed to, to this program. Great news, thank you very much. Council Member Castellano. Um, firstly, uh, and again, um, just to reiterate other council members, thank you so much for being here. And I'm quite excited about this collaboration um, that's taken, or, you know, I mean, I know you've collaborated for years in small ways, but it just seems like, um, the way that you're working together now creates such an opportunity for all of us locally. Um, something you didn't talk too much about, it, and I know you've been here a while already, but um, it's just how you might uh, really work with some of the high schools or the you know the schools here. I, um, I'd be curious to hear if you have some ideas around that. Tom, can may, may I may I start that conversation? Okay. Go um, ahead. <laughs> we, we we have recognized that that we we have to bring our HCOE partners in this conversation because because we we see our students not just from high school students to college to CR to HSU, but the whole pathway from grade school to HSU. So building that stronger academic pathway from K through 12 to CR to HSU is, is the next level of our conversation. But, but quite, quite frankly, we have not left the HCOE or the K through 12 out of the conversation at, at, at this point, because we have a lot of pathways already developed through K through 12, but also looking at um, early outreach, um, but also putting the, the high school students in college courses. So the sort of dual enrollment program that's called a CCAP for CR, that, that is just gaining more and more strength and more commitment, not just from myself and our board of trustees, but our faculty now recognize that our dual enrollment program isn't just for those students who are high caliber, if you will, but we see this as the opportunity of, of motivating students who are margins, who may need a little bit extra emphasis in and they may find that in a course or two at CR, and they can use that to for their high school graduation, but also transfer to HSU. So we're looking at the whole continuum, K through 12 through baccalaureate. Fantastic. And um, sorry, President Jackson, did you want to chime in? Or? May I add, if, 
if I may, Mayor, add a sentence or two to President Flamers. One of the first things we did at HSU about 20 months ago was to refocus some of our recruiting efforts in the Northern counties, primarily the North Coast. And we've been very deliberate about that right down to creating the Humboldt First Scholarship, which some of you generously gave to and supported local students. That continues today. And while the numbers may not necessarily use today, one of the unique outcomes of that was HCOE's College Connect program, pivoting to actually uh, work very closely with the CRHSU degree pathways model. So there's, come, there's things that are happening out there that, that really are centered around the local students and getting them into the pipeline. I have also said, and I'll, I, I should say it again, it, it's more important to me as HSU's president as we start the process. A good city student at CR that graduates becomes a prospect for HSU, and that prospect may lead to a four-year degree for our community. And so if it means starting at CR, and I'm a community college graduate, as it's key, and we welcome that every day of the week. All right. Thank you. Council. Oh, wait, Leslie still wasn't finished, and then we're yeah, sorry. <laughs> Just, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot more. There's much more I could say, but um, I just want to plant this seed um, because about five years ago, I I, uh, I, I studied contemporary performance, but um, I organized a contemporary performance or co-organized a contemporary performance intensive that we rented facilities at HSU and brought uh, teachers and performers and dancers from actually from all over the world the main staff was from Europe um, to teach here and you know and it, it was very much you know we just rented the facilities but I think there are you know some some opportunities there's such beautiful facilities here locally that um, you know within the shift to a, a kind of polytechnic focus of creating some different kinds of uh, national and international collaborations that could still kind of bring excellence in the arts to the region. I, I think maybe even in a different way than than uh, has been possible in, in you know in different periods. Um, yeah, I, I just think that. Uh, any, anyways, so uh, thank you so much, though, for being here. Councilmember Rayo. I just while I was thinking about um, all of CR's wonderful programs, I was also thinking about the um, construction trades and just how valuable it is to have that hands-on learning opportunity um, and how needed it is. I mean, in our area, uh, you can't find a good contractor to save your life. <laughs> it's like the longest wait. I say that, but I have a wonderful contractor working on uh, my property right now, but gosh, it was a wait. It was quite a wait. And um, so as you know, as we see that growth in this area, it's just a natural need. And, and I wanted to share appreciation for that. And also how many people I know who have like gone gone back to school to learn those those life skills. So, you know, it's just such a valuable resource for community members who who just want to take a ha handful of classes and, and round out their kind of, you know, adult life skills education. So um the, those are also programs that I know are really cherished in this community. Thank you. Our, our, our construction tech program is an absolute jewel for CR. So thank you for saying that. Anybody else? Council Member Bauer. Yeah, thank you both for coming and, and putting this great presentation together. Um, I had a question about, you know, I know we have a lot of students that commute to CR to HSU from Eureka. And I'm just wondering, is there a potential for a partnership for student housing? Um, and then second is, um, you know, facility needs for the polytechnic, you know, 
Eureka would love to be a part of that. If, if that's something in the cards, you know, we have availability, I think, um, in commercial property. So just a couple of, of things to think about or, or maybe something you want to talk about. If I may, Keith, <clears throat> Mayor. Well, yeah. Go ahead, Tom. The, I mean, whether we become polytechnic or not as a university, HSU has to explore the facilities from Crescent City all the way through to Fortuna, uh, into Ferndale for that matter as well. It, it's important because there are resources and facilities up and down the North Coast that may be underutilized or might be in the perfect position to be repurposed for educational purposes in a very meaningful way. At the center of this is Eureka. And so I, there's, there's no secret that HSU has been deliberate about trying to be more engaged in Eureka and the opportunities are all there. As far as housing and, and other locations, we, we're having those conversations, not only with CR, but also with the city particularly the mayor and others. And if they come to some fruition, then you'll know about them in, in due time, like all of us will, but it's not for lack of uh, trying to figure out uh, different ways to use all the good things that we have already around us without investing more dollars into something new when we already have something available. So look for more of that creativity, that creative thought in the coming months, if not next year. I hope that answered or responded in part to your your question, Keith, you might have something else you want to add to that. No, I, I agree 100 percent, Tom. All right. Well, I'm so glad that you guys, oh, Council Member Bagel. Well, yeah, I'm the only one that hasn't talked. So I just <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you both so much for this really great presentation. Uh, this presentation, I'm really grateful that um, there is this collaboration happening. Um, and we are right in the middle. And I look forward to uh, student housing moving forward in Eureka. I think that's a, a great opportunity uh, to partner. Um, I also, um, you know, I'm really excited about just this opportunity for people to, um, to do both and together, um, both, both schools together. I think that's gonna be really helpful and I look forward to this kind of partnership, hopefully, fingers crossed, maybe even keeping some of our kids at home. I would love that. So thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you both. And I, of course, am very grateful that you guys took your time this evening to come out. I always enjoy seeing you and um, having a university and a college, it, those add quality of life to any community and to have to be surrounded by um, those educational institutions and to know that they're working together collaboratively can only benefit all of us. So I'm very excited. I'm very excited for the potential um, opportunities coming in the future and always interested in continuing our conversations to move anything forward as quickly as we can. So we'll see you all very soon. Thank you kindly, all of you. Bye-bye. Um, the next item on the agenda is actually just a really brief update. I got a call from uh, Kathy Montaigne, who was, is the current executive director of North Coast Children's Services. And they are um, working on a piece of property here in Eureka. That property has been getting a lot of attention from neighbors. And she said, you know, a lot of people wanna know what's going on. Can I come and tell you about it? And I said, sure. Um, but she sent her incoming soon to be executive director, Rodney, uh, today to fill us in. So the floor is yours, Rodney. All right, well, thank you, Mayor Seaman, and thanks to City Council for allowing me the time to um, speak to you tonight. Yeah, um, as Susan was saying, we purchased this property a couple years ago um, and have been in the process of trying to open a center here across the street from the library. Um, and, you know, originally we planned to re remodel the 
the, the building that was there and create a Head Start facility um, to serve 16 preschool age children and eventually expand to do some early Head Start center program there. In that process, it became um, kind of clear with some of the, there was some black mold and some other issues that made it clear that um, remodeling wasn't really the option we wanted to go through. So we went through this process, it's taken a long time, um, but we finally secured funding um, at the end of last year, beginning of this year to build a new, a new facility there. Um, yeah, so I wanted to like kind of inform you all that that was in the process. We've been working with an architect and I believe it's this week, it'll be going to the um, project development review. Um, I, excuse me if I get the names wrong, but um, I know there's multiple steps that are involved um, in this process, but um, I believe it's this Thursday that'll be going there for um, input and to share our, our vision of what we'd like to do with the property there. Um, yeah, and so we look forward to working with you. We, you know, really appreciate the um, support we've got from the city in the past. I know we, you know, we have sites on Eureka City Schools campus as well as a center over at on Sonoma at the old firehouse. Um, and so it's been great, you know, the years working with um, the city. And yeah, we just felt like Susan was saying we wanted to give folks an update of where we're at um, in that process. Yeah, so. I'll keep it brief. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any questions about um, what's going on there? Or what he had brought to us? All right. There, I know that um, often things are happening around town and people are like, ooh, wonder what's happening there. wonder what's going on. And uh, I thought that was really nice that you guys came up and uh, updated not just us, but everybody who's watching so they can go, oh, that's what's happening there. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we thought it was appropriate. I mean, and, you know, the city's been so um, helpful in working with us throughout, you know, many different projects throughout the years. But, yeah. yeah, and, you know, I'm personally excited every time we can get more child care opportunities. And I know you guys identified that area as one that was very high need. Um, yeah, and there's no real child care centers on that side of town. Um, you know, and I'm sure people are aware with the pandemic how how devastating that's been to so many um, of the smaller local, you know, child care opportunities in the county. So, yeah, much needed. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming in, and um, we will talk to you soon. I will see you yeah. on Thursday at the Child Care Task Force meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all, and have a great night. Bye-bye. Next up, Director Gerving is, uh, I believe you're going to introduce somebody else to talk about self-generation incentive programs, equity, reliance, Tesla partnership. That's right. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Kelly Allen, your project manager uh, for this project, is going to give you some information tonight about uh, the, the SCHIP ER or uh, Self-Generation Incentive Program Equity Resilience uh, Grant Program from the state of California. And it's something that's been touched on a couple times, I think, at least uh, during the CIP presentation. So we wanted to give you more information tonight about uh, what's really an exciting opportunity for us. And I will hand it off to Kelly. You're muted, Kelly. I guess I should. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Hi, Madam Mayor and uh, Council members. Um, okay. So from there, our battery backup systems are funded through an energy storage rebate program. And this program is called the State of California Self-Generation Incentive Program, or from here on, SGIP. The purpose of SGIP was to allow for critical facilities that support communities' resilience in the event of a PSP or wildfires. And they wanted to prioritize communities that are living in high fire threat areas. Uh, they've experienced two or more PSP events, as well as low income and medically vulnerable customers. The goal was for these communities to have battery backup systems because it would provide a more important component for a more robust emergency preparedness plan in the event of these power outages. 
Okay, so to be eligible for the equity resilience program for non-residential applicants, which is what we went for because it provides more refund, um, it gets the project fully funded. You had to, City of Eureka had to go through two PSD events. We had to serve uh, community members of disadvantaged community and low income. And then you had to be one of the following police station, fire station, emergency responders, um, in our case, water, wastewater, et cetera. I won't go through the whole list. Um, the SGIP program functions on a reimbursement program. So by teaming with Tesla, they paid for all upfront costs. So the first um, round of applications that we submitted um, and looked at with Tesla was for City Hall, the police headquarters, wastewater treatment plant, the water treatment plant, the municipal auditorium, and our low and high tank. When um, evaluating these sites uh, over the last 12 months, their usage needed to be greater than 60 kilowatts. And the police headquarters and municipal auditorium, even though it has two meters, they both still didn't meet that requirement. So we looked at other facilities within the city and we found that the Washington pump station and Hill Street pump station both met that need. So these batteries at these sites will act um, as a peak shaving device, and then they will also supply backup power for 15 to 46 hours, depending on its location, in the event of a power outage. And then the backup generators will kick on once the batteries are depleted for all sites except for City Hall. Okay, so I'll give you a quick update on each site and where we're at currently. The water treatment plant. We have qualified for SGIP. Design and permitting is completed. Construction has started and is expected to complete on March 26th. We have to go through PG&E tie-in and approval to operate the batteries, which will take anywhere from eight to 12 weeks. So being on the latter side with PG&E, we're assuming op batteries will be operational in early May. And when they're operating, they'll um, post supply power for 30 hours during a power outage and they use a storm watch system. So if a storm is coming or a PSP event is expected, they'll automatically start charging so that we will have full capability for the 30 hours. And then they'll do um, the 15 hours once a month, they'll cycle through during those peak shaving hours. So they'll run for 15 hours when we're at the high rates and then they'll kick off and they'll recharge at the lower rates. The high tank and low tank, we have qualified for SGIP there. Design and permitting is completed. Construction will start on March 29th with the completion of April 9th. The eight to 12 weeks for pg e approval will put us at having the batteries operational at the end of May. And then this site will have 30 hours of backup when the power goes out and it'll cycle through monthly for a 15 hour average use time. City Hall. So City Hall has qualified, um, design and permitting completed. Construction is scheduled for April 5th with a completion of April 15th, um, eight to 12 weeks for the pg e tie-in. And we're estimating that the batteries will be operational mid-June. And then these batteries will supply 25 hours of power when the power outage and 12 hours um, of cycle through time during the months. The wastewater treatment plant has qualified for SGIP. We're currently in design and we are estimating the batteries will up and going by early August. And then this being such a massive site, the batteries will only supply power for 15 hours, but still good. And then they'll cycle through for an average use time of seven hours a month. Washington pump station. We have qualified for SGIP and design is complete. We're currently in the permitting approval process. We're scheduled for construction in August with an estimated battery um, being operational at the end of October. This site will get 27 hours of backup power and 13 hours average cycle through time. And Hill Street Pump Station, we are still waiting on approval for this for SGIP, but we're, once they are in place, this site will get 46 hours of use when the power goes out and 23 hours average cycle through time. And the SGIP program, this was one of our last ones. It, very impacted. There's a waiting list. The waiting list is already maxed out. So this one is taking longer than the other ones did. And that's the end. Are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions? 
Uh, Council Member Arroyo. Can we um, share this, this um, great effort with like a press release or <laughs> are you thinking of um, sharing the word beyond this council meeting in, in any specific way? We have not. Um, I did give a presentation to our energy committee um, last at the beginning of the month, but that is the most public that um, we have gone. Thank you. This is really cool. Oh, thank you. It's uh, one of the good things out of COVID, I have to admit, we were able to do a lot of focus on this. It is very, very cool. And from a government perspective, <laughs> I keep saying this, it's been happening really fast. Like this seems like it's been a very fast process. <laughs> so. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Not from your end, but everything's coming like sort of already in process or just in a couple months. So, yes, and and Tesla's fast. These are the fastest construction I've been on. They're on site and they're off. It's been impressive. So nice. Anybody else have any uh, comments or questions? Councilmember uh, Castellano. <laughs> um, just thank you. I'm I'm really excited for this, and I'm sure it took a lot of work so thanks so much and and yes i think a, a press release would be fantastic okay i do agree with that excellent all right it looks like we don't have any other questions thank you very much we will move on now to um the public comment period is there anybody in the audience who would like to make a public comment? I don't see anybody who's not staff. So I believe we can move on. And next on our agenda is a consent calendar or a, yeah, consent calendar. Do I have a motion? Do I have, does anybody want to remove anything first from the consent calendar? All right. See none. Do I have a motion to approve it? I'll make a motion to approve this consent calendar. I'll second. Thank you. Um, can we have a vote, please? Councilmember Castellano? Aye. Councilmember Moulton? Aye. Councilmember Arroyo? Aye. Councilmember Bauer? Aye. And Councilmember Brigell? Yes. Unanimous yes vote, motion carries. All right, so we will move on to our next item, which is item D1, the 2040 General Plan Annual Progress Report. And I would like to invite Principal Planner Kristen Getz to let us know how we're doing. We must be almost there. It's almost 2040, you know. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. Um, yes, we're doing great. And 2040 will be here before we know it, I'm sure. So California government code section 65400 requires cities and counties to submit an annual progress report on the general plan and its implementation to both the city council and the state by April 1st of each year. Apparently, other than the required annual reports regarding progress on the housing element implementation, the city has not submitted an annual progress report since the 2040 general plan was adopted. Therefore, the report in front of you also incorporates data going back to October 2018 when the 2040 general plan was adopted and continues through December of 2020. We have a total of 35 implementation programs listed in the general plan. Uh, two of those programs have yet to be implemented. They are the vegetative maintenance plan for the city owned properties and also um, a program to review the locations of grocery stores within Eureka. And of the remaining 33 programs, or excuse me, the remaining 33 programs are either ongoing or sus substantially completed. And that's my report. I'm happy to an answer any questions that I can. All right. Uh, Council Member Bergell. I just have one. I addressed most of mine in agenda review. I just wanted to make sure that um, the name on the one about archaeology, I think it was D1, that those names have been changed to Telawad Island, not Indian Island. I know that that's a simple detail, but that's an important one. 
Yeah, so that that language actually was taken out of the agenda summary for the surplus lands, but I'm happy to make that change. Thank you so much, Kristen. I mean, Principal Planner Getz. Anybody else have any questions? Council Member Royal. Could you say a little bit more about that um, grocery store um, and neighborhood component? I know that that was really intended to think through like where there are essentially food deserts in the community and what can be done about that. Could you um, kind of explain the thinking about how to approach that? Um, yes, as I find the plan, hang on just a second. Um, Yes, as you mentioned, um, the idea behind the study and the review is to identify um, locations where um, there are food deserts. And um, once we've done that, we can look at the zoning in the surrounding areas and see if there are tweaks or updates that we need to make um, that might encourage um, grocery stores to locate uh, in those areas. At this point in time, um, as I mentioned, the program hasn't actually been begun, but um, I'm hoping that that will happen in the next year or so. Great, thank you so much. All right, any other questions? Seeing none, I will um, ask for public comment, but I don't see anybody who's not on staff here. We'll go through the process. <laughs> All right, seeing no public comment, I will bring it back for comments. And we don't have to, um, it just says receive reports, so we don't have to vote on this, I don't think. That's correct, yes. Anybody have any final thoughts before we move on? Council Member Araya. I, I really am so appreciative of all the work on this that has already happened um so i just wanted to express that and and i'm i'm excited about the grocery store um analysis and thinking through that i know it's kind of um very specific it's a very specific goal um but i i also have been thinking a, a lot about um grocery stores in our communities lately and and especially about um markets that sell um, foods that aren't available in like, like culturally um, sensitive foods for folks in our community. So as we become a more diverse city, I, I just, um, I wondered how we might include um, that lens and an equity lens in this kind of analysis. I mean, it could be as simple as stating that um, this market caters to, you know, this specific group of community members. Um, but I, I would love to have, um, have a look at that. I don't know if we as a city are in any kind of position to, through our planning work, facilitate more equitable growth in that industry um, or make it more feasible, but perhaps that's something to pair with economic development. So. Um, that's just a hope of mine, and I am appreciative of all your work on this. All right, and Council Member Castellano. Um, let's see. Uh, thank you again, Principal Planner Getz, for your work. Um, I I did realize I had a question, um, and it was specifically just about what the um, the creating the historic, where is it? Not the, the historic recognition areas might like indicate, you know, would that kind of be something that would potentially help um, people who owned homes in those areas? Or could you just say a little bit more about that uh, in analysis? Sure, so I'm envisioning at this point in time anyway that um, historic recognition areas would be uh, something kind of similar to a historic district or an overlay um, that identifies certain locations around the city um, where there are uh, hopefully collections maybe of historic properties that are like kind kind of thing. And um, through a process yet to be determined, we would um, create um, uh, 
we, we would identify using the Historic Preservation Commission those areas and then look at ways maybe when how we can help identify those areas such as um, maybe street signage or curb painting or something like that. So that's kind of what I'm envisioning at this point in time, but again, to be determined as we go forward. That, thank you. That's that sounds really neat. Um, and and just to that point, and I know that SP two SP two funding does not cover actual like renovation and preservation, but you know I, I think if we do identify those areas, that that may be something as a city. We, we, you know, we do want to take a look at is how can we support building owners who may not have access to the means to their buildings. You know, I, I I walk around a lot in Eureka. Oh, maybe I'm frozen. Um, I, I walk. We managed mm -hmm. to like we I'm managed frozen. to get the okay. gist of it. I think. Oh, now you look much better though. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> great. You look much less That's good for now. now. <laughs> All right, anybody else have anything to say? All right, well, thank you very much for the work that you've done and uh, your report has been received with uh, gratitude. Great, thank you, everybody. Now, um, item D2, in case you didn't notice on the second agenda, is no longer there. So we are moving on to city manager reports. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I figured tonight, since it's been a topic that kind of got pushed aside because of the um, volume of our agendas over the past couple of months, is I'd talk about litter and some of the things that are um, going on related to that. You know, because of COVID, um, there was a long period of time, especially along our waterfront, where some of our volunteer efforts weren't happening. Um, all of our volunteer trail stewards were um, not running um, during the, the, the heart of COVID, and um, some of the pack out green team things weren't happening as frequently. Um, I'm hoping as you've walked along the waterfront and noticed that there has been a change over the last couple of months, we um, definitely have all three of our volunteer trail stewards up and running on a monthly basis. So both the, all three of the Hikshari, the Wharf Trail and the north end of the waterfront trail, all three of those are going out monthly. Um, both Hikshari <clears throat> and the Wharf Trail go out um, probably about two times a month on a, on a random day throughout the month. Um, they not only remove litter, but they also address some of the invasive issues. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the Wharf Trail applied for a grant um, for the Wharf Trail. And when I say the Wharf Trail, for those who don't know, that's the portion of the trail that goes from Del Norte up to C Street. They maintain the vast majority of that landscape median that goes along Waterfront Drive and do an excellent job of doing so. Um, on the opposite side of that kind of between Del Norte and 14th Street, there's a, um, a ditch alongside the railroad corridor there that's uh, had its issues in the past. And they recently applied for a grant through the um, Humboldt Bay Trail Fund. And they were awarded that grant to do some grading there and hopefully alleviate some of those issues that we've had there. Um, we're not stopping there. Um, we're definitely having more and as much participation with the um, Pack out team and so and uh, and our EQ Eureka component trying to get more frequent cleanups. They they've done more than the quarterly cleanup that they typically have, and we're trying to um, coordinate with them. They just did one last weekend on Saturday. Um, we'll continue to do that. And then from a code enforcement standpoint, you know, we did have a long period of time where we had a backlog of that, especially you know you probably noticed a lot of that on the waterfront, but um, that has you know, that had a little bit to do with the towing and a little bit to do with um, the volunteers associated that I have good news that the, the towing is back and running. And we're hoping to get that volunteer um, effort back and going as well. And we're also looking at potentially some changes on how we address um, at least the overnight parking issues and the issues associated with that. So being able to take care of some of the campers that have been along the waterfront has definitely helped with some of those um, litter issues that we saw definitely in the heart of COVID. So 
And then moving forward uh, during strategic visioning, you all are aware that we um, did approve more maintenance work staffing. Um, that definitely is gonna be concentrated in our commercial areas and definitely spread that um, full-time coverage over the weekend so that we can make sure that it's not just during Monday through Friday that we have coverage there on the weekend too. So we should see some more improvements coming up in um, July, August or so, depending on when we can get those positions filled. Um, so that's all I have. I want to thank all of the council members. I believe three of you were out last week at the uh, Pack Out Green Team cleanup. Thank you. And, um, you know, we'll continue to coordinate. We're trying to push out the Empower Eureka and some of the other neighborhood beautification efforts. And I know that Council Member Castellano has been in preliminary discussions with CSET and Uplift about uh, another program as well. And that's we'll bring that back if it's ever uh, when it's up up and running. So that's all I have. And thank you. Can I ask a question about the towing again? And maybe you said it and I, I missed it, but it's back and running, but the volunteers and the volunteer abatement groups not back. So no, but we right now. We're, we're in the process of bringing it back and the chief can chime in on this. I believe it's it's going to happen soon where the, the head volunteer that was kind of spearheading the success that we had previously should be coming back soon. Um, the, the towing company was out of commission for a while. They're back. And so we've been supplementing those volunteers with EPD staff, mainly Captain Watson, believe it or not, but he's been very responsive to some of the issues that we've had and taking care of those in, a, in, in an efficient way. Stevens. Stevens. Stevens, excuse me. Did I say Watson? You didn't even know you were demoted, did you, Chief? <laughs> I meant Captain Stevens um, was the one who's been spearheading that when we've had, you know, um, calls for service and everything. Excellent. Council Member Burgell. So I'm just curious when we tow, say, a motorhome which there seems to be a whack-a-mole thing happening down on the waterfront drive. Um, how do those costs be absorbed? Where do those costs, where do we, that money come from? Where does that money come from? Well, not all of them get towed. Um, a lot of them are just notified and then they um, voluntarily move. And as you say, that the, a lot of them do come back and then it's going through the whole noticing procedure all over again. Um, but when we, Chief, you want to chime in on this a little bit? I saw him give a thumbs up. Oh, there he is. You're muted. How about now? All right. Uh, you know, Captain Stevens could create, obviously speak in much greater detail about this. Um, like the city manager said, many of them aren't towed. They uh, voluntarily move with a little bit of encouragement. Um, we have a, a contract with, I think, uh, I believe it's a one specific tow company that handles the oversized large RVs and recreational vehicles, trailers, things like that. Uh, they absorb some of their costs depending on what recycling is worth if the vehicles are destroyed. I don't know what they charge us for that. Um, it can be expensive to remove those vehicles. Certainly, many of them have some serious environmental issues with leaking into the ground, storm drains, and other kind of things, trash and litter around that are a concern uh, that gets stacked onto the issue in addition to um, you know the neighborhood complaints that we get on that. So we did have a period of time when we had nobody available to tow anything. Uh, that created some problems. That's not the case at the moment. And as the city manager said, I got word a couple of weeks ago, looks like part of our fantastic volunteer abatement team may be coming back in the next few weeks uh, to help get the ball rolling on that again, as well as documentation with existing staff that we've been trying to use much of it, most of it, quite frankly, spearheaded by Captain Stevens and very complaint based. Uh, it, you know, it's just the nature of it. It's all over town. And so an area gets particularly problematic. We get a call and we have to make some time to go down there and start the noticing. There's there's quite a bit of noticing, uh, you know, seven and a uh, period of time that takes place before anything is done with any of the vehicles. And by the way, I just want to commend Chief Watson for being home and being uh, Mr. Mom for his uh, 
three children that are there. Good job, Chief. Thank you. And my eight year old thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> have a good night. All right. Anybody have any other questions or comments about the city manager report? If not, we will move on to uh, council reports. And I will go ahead and start with Council Member Castellano. Okie doke. Um, let's see. Well, um, mostly, uh, let me, I'm going to turn off my video, I guess. Okay. Maybe that's better. Um, so mostly I've been attending kind of meetings related to housing, litter, um, homelessness, um, broadband, economic development. Um, I'm also part of the HWMA uh, hiring committee from the, of the board. So I've been kind of involved with that process, which has been pretty interesting. And um, I did attend, <laughs> along with Council Member Brickell and Council, Council Member Bauer, the, the pack out cleanup. I also um, had a really fantastic tour with Mike Sipra of Friends of the Dunes of the new Samoa Dunes and Wetlands Conservation Area, which is just, it's, it's a remarkable place and we're, yeah, what a kind of jewel of the entire region. So that was, um, a really exciting opportunity to, to go out there. And I, I just love the dunes. So I'm thankful for that. And I think that's about all I've been up to. All right. Thank you very much. Council Member Moulton. I'm doing that tour tomorrow with Friends of the Dunes, although I'm very familiar with that uh, location as it is Dead Man's Drop for the Kinetic Grand Championship. <laughs> I was sent some GPS coordinates of where to go. And I was like, that's the says man's bottom. I know exactly where we put the porta potty right there. Um, so on um, council related stuff, I have been trying to educate myself on the breadth and depth of services available for people experiencing homelessness in our community. So I got to tour Betty with, uh, I got to spend an afternoon with Betty Chin, toured all of her facilities from the day center over to the village, the women's shelter, um, and all the different things available there, which is uh, incredibly enlightening and incredibly inspiring. Um, and hopefully I can get a broader picture of what's actually happening, because um, there is a lot sort of in the picture from Betty, obviously, but from other agencies going on around the community to help folks who are experiencing homelessness. And then I just wanted to give a shout out. Uh, we received a letter as counsel from Sophia, age nine in Eureka, who's concerned about litter herself, uh, specifically in waterways and the rivers. And I wanted to um, thank Sophia for that input and say that, uh, that it's obvious that's a priority for us as well. We love our beautiful waterway, waterways and our fish and don't want them clogged up with trash. And I encourage everyone to communicate your concerns and your kudos as well to the council. We're here and we're grateful for any input from the community. So thank you to Sophia, age nine in Eureka, who's probably not watching this, but uh, I'm grateful for her input anyway. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going by wards. Ward three is council member Arroyo. I always have to figure out if it's you or Kim, because <laughs> you guys- So work. does everyone else in the entire city of Eureka. Okay. <laughs> also, I think we're still listed as each other's phone numbers in the phone book. Um, and I don't know, I've called them to try to get that fixed and nothing doing. So, um, but we're both here for Eureka, no matter what. <laughs> um, let's see, I um, I have actually been, wanted to use my time to remind folks of a really important resource in our community. I've been um, re recertifying as a victim advocate in the Coast Guard, which is a um, crisis peer support person for um, survivors of sexual assault in the service. And through that process, I've become reacquainted um, through some ongoing training with with the amazing services that North Coast Rape Crisis Team provides. And I just wanted to share that 
I don't know that people realize that um, anyone can call them at any time on their 24 seven hotline and it is completely confidential. So even if you disclose something that you have done or something that, um, you know, perhaps would be a, a, um, a red flag, they still can't convey that information. So they are completely confidential, able to listen to any and all topics that anyone want, might, might want to discuss around um, assault and survivorship. So I just wanted to share that their phone number locally and Humble is 707-445-2881. They also have a Del Norte number, but I'm not going to read that right now. Um, but again, humble to 707-445-2881-247, completely free and completely confidential hotline. Um, so it's an incredible resource. And there just aren't very many places that people who have had those experiences can go. Actually, there are a lot of places, but I feel like there aren't um, very many where it's clearly expressed um, that it's completely 100% confidential. So I want to share that with folks in the community. Um, beyond that, I am um, I am still on Coast Guard active duty, so I am doing that. Um, I am was happy to have received my second vaccination, and I encourage everyone um, when your when your number is up to get that um, to to go ahead and do it. Um, it was really uh, you know. I didn't feel great for a couple of days, but um, I could tell my immune system was kicking in. So please, please contribute to the vaccinated community and, um, and do that when you're able. Um, we had a wonderful city county two by two meeting. So um, council member Bergell and myself met with supervisors, um, Bass and Bone, <laughs> and to think about Rex's last name. <laughs> Um, and we just had a really um, good connection over, you know, things that were going on um, that affect both the city and the county that um, are in our, you know, parts of our community and, and some upcoming opportunities that I think are um, going to really solve some of our uh, most challenging issues. So I'll leave you in suspense there until they come to fruition, but it was great to connect on those. Um, I wanted to thank City Manager Slattery for taking myself and one of my former HSU students on a field tour of the great project at Martin Slough. So we went and rode golf carts around the golf course and looked at the incredible fisheries restoration project um, that's happening there and the progress that was made this summer that both um, improved habitat and um, is going to drastically improve flooding and already has on the golf course. So um, there are a lot of new stream channels and ponds that weren't there before, um, but they, um, they are serving a purpose and I'm so proud that we were able to be a partner in that. Um, I think the only other thing that was on my um, radar for this meeting was the, I know we've all been approached to talk about the hazard pay ordinance and my understanding after last meeting was that we were going to reach out to the city manager and city attorney with our thoughts on that so I would encourage everyone if you have not had the opportunity to do that to do that um, I have shared um, my thoughts and interest in supporting that with our staff but um, I, I think we are still in the process of giving them the feedback so that is all I have and I'll pass it to the next person Councilmember Bauer. Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, typical meetings, uh, Joint Powers Authority, we meet every couple of weeks. Um, I participated um, with my fellow council members at, on the pack out cleanup. And I will say it was really fun to be around human beings, you know, socially distanced. <laughs> and I, I, I met a woman named uh, Jenny from Trinidad, who came all the way down to help for, for that, you know, kind of hour. And um, it was just great to see people from all over and a lot of people showed up to, to beautify our, our city and clean up our waterways. And, and we picked up quite a bit and there's a lot more to do. We could have spent four hours um, doing, uh, doing that work, but uh, it was a real pleasure to, to see people come out and so many people 
wanting to help out. So it was great. Um, you know, other than that, I had a couple of things. Um, this is something kind of interesting that came up oh, months ago. One of my neighbors is uh, a, a history buff, and he had talked about the cemetery um, there right next to Cooper Gulch and how it, it contains, I want to say, 30 to 50 Civil War veterans. And um, so a lot of people came here, you know, for what it's worth, you know, they came for to uh, man the fort. Um, but there's a lot of, of people in that, you know, deceased that are there that a lot of historical context and there's an opportunity there to kind of reinvigorate uh, what some people just kind of go by and it's not very pretty, but um, I think there's some historical um, opportunities there to clean it up and make it something that is, you know, not so dreary and, and maybe offer opportunities for, uh, you know, history lessons um, in a lot of ways. And so I'm kind of interested in exploring that because um, uh, I, I do like history and, um, and I'm interested in, in seeing what, you know, what we can do with that. So just something that I'm exploring. And I talked to city manager Slattery about the boat launch uh, recently, you know, fishing season's coming up. A lot of kayaker use um, in the summer and kind of the need to, to, there's two lanes there and really you can only use one. And so we talked about how we can maintain it so that we can have more use um, and, and get, it, it becomes quite a line if you've ever seen it early in the morning during salmon season and whatnot, but it gives like a heavy amount of use if we could, you know, maintain it in such a way that uh, we can improve it for a lot of out-of-towners will probably be showing up, um, and, and our, our our citizens. It'd be really cool to to get on that. And that's just a matter of you know staff, which we're which we're working on. So, um, oh, one last thing. It's really cool. Um, sporting events are coming back. Our, our our youth are able to to get back out on the field, and and I gotta say, I'm really excited. Um, watching, you know, my kids play sports and, and our, our whole community getting back out there. I'm happy it's happening. It feels like we're turning the corner a little bit, you know. Um, and I meant, I, I meant to mention this to HSU, like, you know, we have needs. Our, our community has needs for, for sporting um, venues, and they have this whole football field. It's just sitting there. And how can we partner with them so that our youth, and go there and use it and it's kind of complicated in some ways and I'm, I'm looking at how do we you know make that connection with them so that our youth have a place to go when it's pouring rain and they have a turf field there you know how can we share a facility that's not getting used so um, that's about it thank you right on council member for yeah Of Ward 5. Of Ward 5, who cannot unmute to save her life. So let's see. Okay, so I actually attended the first um, equity committee meeting for Humboldt Bay Fire, and that was very interesting. I'm really looking forward um, to working with that and learning uh, what I can um, and growing the department in that, in that regard. So I'm very excited about that. I too attended, um, as you heard, the Pack Out Green team, and I was reminded just how thick the mud in the bay is. I just have to tell you guys, because this is so funny. So I was out in the water in the bay, and I had my boots on, my marsh boots, and um, I got stuck. And so I had to crawl out of the water and leave my boots in the bay, and then try and yank them out of the mud. It was quite exciting and quite fun. But I'm happy to report that um, I personally only collected one full bag of um, garbage bag, you know, of trash. Um, so it seemed that though there was a lot of trash, there wasn't a lot of trash. I mean, I've seen a lot more trash. So I was really grateful for that. Um, uh, I also wanted to bring up something that is very important and that staff is working on uh, with the League of Cities. Um, 
So AB1344, and I believe it's AB1810, um, the state of California is working to remove local control of SEPs in, uh, in California. And we've lived that. Um, it, it didn't work well for our city, in my opinion. Um, but part of this, this particular item will also bring forward CEQA exemption for SEPs. And it also removes the opportunity. Sites cannot be shut down for being a public nuisance. Um, and these, this is problematic uh, in my mind, in our city, for sure, probably in the state of California. I know that there'll be a lot of um, pushback on that. And I'm hopeful that we can partner, and we are, with the League of Cities to, um, to make sure that this doesn't happen, at least in our own city. You know, as, as many of you know, I do um, support syringe exchange programs. I think they're important. Um, but not having local control has really caused our city uh, a lot of problems. And the idea that we cannot, they cannot be shut down because of nuisance is very problematic, um, depending on, on the neighborhood. So um, I'm in full support of working against that. Um, and I just wanted to bring it forward because I think the public needs to be aware that this is happening in our state um, and that you too can have an opinion and get involved in this um, if you're interested because it's very critical. Uh, let me see. Oh yeah, and then I attended the, the city county meeting. That was really great. And then I've had several calls um, from people wanting me to bring forward this ordinance for hazard pay. Um, and so, uh, and I'm sure that they've talked to all council members and asked each and every one of you to bring that forward. I currently, to be honest with you, um, I still have a lot of questions um, before I would be interested in passing such ordinance. Can I, um, can I at this point, I I just think I should uh, turn off my camera. <laughs> I don't know at which point I have to recuse myself, but my husband works in the grocery business. So I'm going to go on mute and I am going to stop my video and I'm going to listen for the conversation. Over. Thank you. Thank you. So what I was saying is that I still have many questions and I'm not really ready to bring it forward. Um, but I wanted to put that out there because it was asked of me and um, generally when people, you know, have concerns, I do try and bring them forward to the public as necessary. So I don't know if anybody had any thoughts on that. Um, if not, we can just move forward and bring the mayor back. We can't really talk about our thoughts on it, right? I mean, we could just- Yeah, we can't. It has to be like a, <laughs> a nod or not kind of thing. You so. want, I, I guess what I'm saying then is, it was asked of me to bring it forward and I'm sure it was asked of several of you. I'm bringing it forward and I'm asking you, are you interested in pursuing this? Are you not interested in pursuing this? This is up to you because like I said, I'm not necessarily, I need more information. So I think the thing that you can discuss is whether to give direction to staff to add this to a future agenda or not. But the merits of the idea um, are, were not announced as part of our agenda process and therefore can't really can't really go into that. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney Black. Also, I'd say it, if it is a desire to add it, in what form is it? Is it informational? Is it the ordinance itself? What what is it? Kim? Yes. Oh, I just say, what do you? What? I, as I said, so let me just be clear. I still have a lot of questions about this. It was asked of me personally, and I'm sure other members of council who have met with the group to bring it forward to, to see if it would be put on the agenda. I still have a lot of questions, so I'm not, I'm not clear of where I am personally, but I'm bringing it forward because I was asked to. And we, uh, Council Member Castellano brought it forward last meeting. 
and was interested in putting it on the agenda. So this is why I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it forward for clarity, I guess, is why I'm bringing it forward and no one else did. Thank you for that, Kim. I yeah, it's a it's a process awkwardness for me. So it's like it's not about the content for me. It's about the process of how to put how to bring up a new topic. Um, so it sounds like you're talking about putting it on the agenda. Is that so correct? I'm talking of, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm not. What I'm talking about is that it has been brought forward to me. Let me say it again clearer. Uh, it's been brought forward to me to have it put on the agenda and to talk about it. I personally am not clear on how I feel about it, but because I said that I would bring it forward to be potentially put on agenda, that's why I'm doing so in this moment. Um, so the idea of it, you know, I leave it, I, I guess I leave it to you because I'm not, I'm not clear how, how I feel about it yet. And the process was last meeting, we discussed it and council member Castellano brought it up. We all had meetings with um, the people scheduled for after the meeting. And so we didn't allow council member Castellano at that time. We didn't, not that we didn't allow her, but we didn't discuss uh, putting it on the agenda at that time because we all had meetings with them. Now we've all had meetings with them. I still feel unclear. And I guess I'm bringing it forward to ask you all um, if this is something that you feel like should be on the agenda or if you need more information. Well, I will say that I have not had meetings. Oh, you haven't? Uh, no, I have not um, been talking about it and I have questions myself. So I'm unprepared at this time for um, it to be on the agenda. Um, you know, I have simple questions like why not, why not hardware store workers? Why not gas station employees? Why not a lab technician? Why not technicians at the hospital? You know, um, it goes on and on and on, right? Um, so yeah, I'm un unprepared for discussion at this point, but um, I have questions the same as you do. Thank you. So maybe maybe I could clarify, um, and we talked about this before, the city, I believe it's in the charter, the city charter provides that any three members of the council can put an item on the agenda. And um, Alternatively, the mayor, and of course you've delegated authority to the city manager. Um, so the, the question is without substantive discussion, do you want this on the agenda to have it as a discussion item uh, in which you would agendize discussing the pros and cons and what next? Um, but it's within your power to order that a draft ordinance be brought back for potential introduction. Um, you know, those are those are your uh, authorities as the council. Thank you. And I saw, did I see your hand, Councilmember Castellano, or not? Oh, I, I think I was I was going to say something similar to what uh, Attorney Black was saying, um, mm -hmm. just in terms of. Um, I mean, I, I spoke to this at the last meeting, but I'm definitely, <laughs> am I frozen? No. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. You're, you're back, you're back. You did freeze. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I'm definitely, you know, I mean, to me, the only way we can learn more publicly is to put it on the agenda. Um, so I, you know, I definitely support that. Um, I would be supportive personally of putting it on the agenda as an informational item with the possibility of creating an action item uh, or or of um you know if, if we so chose after hearing the information to create action from that if that makes sense that's there any other comments yeah 
I, I'm okay with a, a discussion on it, but informational um, at this point. Same here. I'm in favor of information. <laughs> So it's pretty clear. So what we'll do is we'll put together a brief introduction with some understanding of what's being proposed and you guys can have a discussion about it. Thank you. Want to bring the mayor back? Okay. I think technically the um not to be Ms. by the book, but I think technically the rule on recusing is you have to actually sign out of the call. <laughs> well, I think that they just can't, according to the attorney, I, they can't see my face and they can't hear me. Who just took a class on the brown app? Oh. <laughs> Raise your hand, Scott. I know you were there. <laughs> Clearly somebody was paying more attention than the other. Yeah. <laughs> right. well, the rest of us haven't it. taken a class on it during the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Specific to this and like the rules around Facebook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, my direction was to uh, mute and to turn off my camera so that people could not gauge my, uh, gauge my reactions. And Attorney Black could chime in on this. The, the mayor isn't technically a voting member of the. Well, I guess if there's, well, it, it could, it could happen. Yes. Yeah. So if it's, if it's said that you have to leave the zoom, um, then, uh, I stand corrected. That's, but I don't think, I don't think there was a significant violation. So, um, when it comes to the discussion at another meeting, I will leave completely. And then somebody will have to call me and get me to come back. Actually, Mayor, I can put you into a timeout room, basically. <laughs> it's your individual breakout room. Yeah, I'll put you in. <laughs> well, you're was to get, come up you're getting it down, Pam. You really are. <laughs> and if it was to come up again, obviously, for some sort of action item or direction, um, that's a little bit more important, I would say, than just putting it on the agenda. All right. Was there anything else, Councilman? No, Thank you, everyone. I just, um, I think I was, I think I was um, frozen. So that's all. Well, that's it. Well, I just came back to adjourn. Or oh, you guys would have been here forever and ever. I know I'm sorry, Kim could have adjourned too, but uh, I will see, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Oh, no, in one week when we come back and do our last visioning session on March 30th. 30th. See you then. Thank you. Hey, before, sorry, before we oh. adjourn, could you say what the last visioning session will be just for community members who may be watching and want to know? Something to that? I would love Miles to. Okay. So uh, we discussed this briefly. I believe it was my last city manager's report, but the intent is um, there was some agreed upon initiatives for the five goals. Um, those are already incorporated. There was um, a handful or so more. I'm having a hard time getting the slides. I don't know how many of them are of initiatives that were above and beyond that. And so we plan and bring those back um, with the consultants and um, determining which of those are going to be added to the initiatives that are on there now. So that'll happen. It's actually two weeks from now. Uh, so we have an extra week here. It's March 30th. Um, and it'll be on Tuesday, March 30th at five, correct, Assistant City Manager Powell? Yes. yes. And so uh, Assistant City Manager Powell will be putting out an agenda next week um, for that, for the um, meeting that will happen on the 30th. Thank you. And it's from 5 to 6.30 is what I have in my calendar, just for people who want to plan ahead. For all those people watching at home. Those people watching at 4 a.m. <laughs> Nursing their babies. Boy, I remember that. <laughs> and then with that, now we are officially adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>